Hi, thank you so much for coming. Um, welcome, ladies and gen all two gentlemen. Thank you for, and Paul, sorry, three. Thank you. I might have missed some. Gender's is a social construct. Let's back up. Um, it is my total honor to introduce Jennifer Weiner, who needs no introduction. I know all of you must be just huge fans, because I know she has a lot of huge fans who follow her every move on Twitter, which is kind of what we're here to talk about tonight. You may also know her as the author of many books, <laughs> including All Fall Down, uh, which is a bit of a departure for her, a little darker than the usual stuff. It deals with addiction and, uh, and the internet and uh, uh, you know, just uh, some of the some of the more complex things about being alive and online today, and we'll talk about that too. So, without any more ado, um, here's Jen. Yay! Okay. So I hold this and sit here. Do I have it right? Okay, cool. Can I have the first slide, please? <laughs> This is part of my therapy. Um, do you guys know about exposure therapy? Where like, there's something that scares you and you have to look at it over and over and over again? So that, that's that. Hello. Oh my God, I'm turning. It's like he's drawn me magnetically. Shit. Okay. Um, some are born to greatness. Some have greatness thrust upon them. It's pretty much the same with writers and social media. Some of us took to blogs and MySpace and Facebook and Twitter. Okay, thank you, thank you. Yes, that's great. Okay, I'm just gonna hold on like this. I'm sure this is some kind of sexual position and it has a name. It's like the, the obedient chair. Okay, there's a footrest. Yeah, but then I'll spin. I, I gotta do this, okay. Um, Okay, some of us took to blogs and MySpace and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and whatever else the kids are doing these days with grace and ease. Some latched onto social media like a life raft in stormy seas, and some were ordered at metaphoric gunpoint by their publishers or editors or well-meaning agents and publicists. Here is Twitter, get on it now. A lucky few writers who get so much publicity that they can take it or leave it have made second careers of trashing the medium and any writer who uses it. Um, this speech is for the rest of us. And the first thing that writers have to do is accept the new world order. This stuff isn't optional anymore. Once upon a time, say in 2000, an author wasn't expected to be anything more than a postage-sized photo and a paragraph of biography on the back flap of her book. A writer's job was to write, and for a week or two per book to try to acquire enough social skills, I'm gonna stand up, I think, <laughs> to go out amongst the normies on book tour where you would have to look presentable for the first time in months and try not to spit when you talked. <laughs> Those days are gone. Yes, there are still a handful of authors who can survive with nothing more than a photograph, a bare bones website, and a Facebook page they've been on exactly once to announce that they will not be doing Facebook. Can I have the next slide? Okay, so that's a note from Jeffrey Eugenides, um, where he says, as you may have surmised, the good people at my publishing house, Ferris, Strauss, and Giroux, are responsible for the creation and maintenance of this page. In addition to being temperamentally disinclined to join Facebook, my daughter calls this being old. I've been much too busy on tour these past weeks to send in personal posts. So, you know, that, that's his one um, time on Facebook. It's, it's kind of epic. Okay. Turn the page. Um, so there are authors who can get away with that, and, and we call them straight white men. <laughs> um, can, can I have the next slide? Okay, so that's, that's Jeffrey Eugenides again in Vogue in 2012. Um, he's, he's being Henry James, and that's model Natalia Volodnova as Edith Wharton, because evidently every single female author in America was busy that day. Um, 
and, and I kid, it's not, it's not just straight white men. There's Jennifer Egan and, and Clara Masood. Um, the 1% of the 1%, the creme de la creme of the literati, the two reviews and a profile crew, your Atticus Lishes, your Tom Paradas, Meg Wolitzers, Nicholson Bakers, and even at that level, when the New York Times turns itself into your personal PR machine, you're still expected to give the occasional interview and to agree to the website or Facebook page that your editor's assistant set up and maintains. And then there's the rest of us, especially the rest of us women who, I'm sorry to say, to go all like buzzkill feminist on you, but women continue to get proportionally less coverage and our fiction is published far less frequently than work by men. We all know the state of book reviewing at this moment in America. You can count the number of newspapers with freestanding sections devoted to books on one hand and have fingers left over. Turning the page. A handful of magazines publish original fiction. A slightly larger handful devote a third of the page here or half a column there to book coverage. As for getting on TV, unless your book is based on a wild true story, or you killed someone between delivery and acceptance and publication, <laughs> you will have to work overtime and have a publicist willing to call in major favors to get on a national show. And as for local TV, in order to show up there, you have to be on an actual physical book tour, which your publisher may or may not fund, which leaves the internet. Um, let me take you back to the year 2000. Um, okay, so George Bush was in the right White House, and Ross and Rachel still had not hooked up. And I was at the Philadelphia Inquirer, and I'd written a novel in my spare time. Um, and during the run-up to publication, my mother's then-girlfriend built me a website. I, I remember lots of candid pictures of my dog. And I remember telling my publisher that I wanted to start a weblog. And I heard, great, which was quickly followed by, what is a weblog? So I launched my weblog, which I treated as a diary that I imagine maybe 10 people were reading, um, three of them being my siblings, one of them being my mom, and the remaining six being people I'd met in Weight Watchers. <laughs> um, I went into a level of granular and personal detail that I cringe to recall. I am fairly certain I told the internet when I went into labor with my first child. Um, two weeks late, it was, I'd been waiting. Um, Every good review, every bad review, every good day, every bad day, every single thing that happened on the road to publication was explicitly cataloged and posted for posterity. The only smart thing I did was disable the comment feature. The only thing I could say in my defense is I was young, or at least younger. We were all still figuring it out. Then came MySpace. I was there. Then Facebook. I think I'm still on MySpace. I'm kind of scared to look. I don't know. Okay, then Facebook, and I had a personal page, and in short order, I had 5,000 friends, and I'm putting quotes around friends, um, before there was the option of fan pages, which is the word I cringe at using. Fans, not pages. I'm okay with pages. Then finally, like rain in a drought, came Twitter. And I'm sure by this time next year, we'll be talking about the next new thing, Snapchat, or Yik Yak, or Hip Picks, or Chit Chat. But because the trend seems to be toward the shorter, faster, and increasingly more, increasingly more ephemeral, I will be talking mostly about Twitter. So back in the day, it was okay if all anybody knew about you was what you looked like in your like, severely airbrushed author photo, and maybe where you lived in the titles of your books. Um, these days, the stakes have been raised. Um, there are authors and performers and actors and comedians who are posting bikini shots and selfies portraits of their smoothies, pictures of their kids, just minutes out of the womb sometimes. Um, there are photos from readings, tweets about breakfast, their morning jog, their frustration at the coffee shop when the barista spells their name wrong again. Readers have come to expect a certain feeling of intimacy, a certain level of disclosure. They've gotten used to much, much more information than they ever had access to before. That is the reality, the genie that won't go back in the bottle. How much information you give out, how much of yourself you put out there is negotiable. Being there is not. So, that being said, Twitter might no longer be optional, but it does not have to be torture. It can even be your friend. So now you're on Twitter. What are you going to say? Let me start by telling you what you're not going to say. Here's my book. Buy my book. Here's an awesome review that my book got. 
here's a retweet of a tweet where someone tweeted something nice about my book. Um, as we know, Twitter gets a bad rap from certain quarters, certain quarters. Jennifer Weiner-ish self-promotion is actually a thing, at least according to Jonathan Franzen, who I suspect has never spent even five minutes on social media to see what I'm actually doing there, but hey, let's not let research get in the way of a zinger. Okay, so the truth is, self-promotion is the absolute last thing that you want to do on Twitter. You want to do it sparingly, carefully, modestly, thoughtfully, and absolutely as little as possible. People on Twitter are there for entertainment, for information, for amusement, and above all, for connection. They want to feel like they're getting to know you as a real person. They want to know what you care about, how you spend your time. They want to talk with you, not at you, but with you. They do not want to feel like they've wandered into a late night TV channel and spent 30 minutes listening to someone trying to sell them an opera. I have one, it's awesome. <laughs> that shit has changed my life. Um, can I have some water, please? Some, I, I love giving speeches, because you just say like, could someone bring you some water? And it's gonna happen, just watch. Okay. Um, the fastest way to shed followers and Facebook friends is to use those sites exclusively or even primarily as places to sell books. Which is not to say that maintaining an authentic presence on Facebook or Twitter won't sell books, but if that is your number one goal, if that's all you're doing, if it's the only reason you're there, your readers will know and readers will leave. So does being all in mean letting it all hang out? There are people who share everything. I know what their kids' names are and what their living rooms look like and where they went on vacation and what they had for dinner. There are people who tweet constantly from good morning and need coffee to so tired and stuck in traffic and on like magic, and on and on, all day long, every petty annoyance and tiny triumph cataloged in between candid shots at their kids. That's not how I roll, and it's not how I recommend you roll either, not unless you're talented enough to elevate the mundane to the hilarious, and you're committed to paying for lots and lots of therapy for your children. <laughs> Everyone has to figure out what's okay and what isn't, what they want to reveal, and what they can't stand the thought of being online. As I got used to the internet, as I made my way from blog to Twitter, I had to feel out, figure out where I was comfortable, what I was willing to share and what I wasn't. And I decided that I didn't want people knowing what my daughters look like or where they go. And I rarely mention their names, I'd never post their pictures. Other writers do, and if that works for them and their readers, that's fine. Again, that is my personal line. You'll find your own. But authenticity does not mean full disclosure or overshare. So if I'm not posting pictures of my kids holding copies of my book and saying, please buy this so I don't have to feed them generic Oreos, what am I going to do on Twitter? And if I'm not promoting my work, which, by the way, is why my publisher wants me to be there, what am I supposed to be doing? OK, first thing, find your voice. It can be the voice you use in your fiction, or it can be more conversational. Lucky me, I basically write the way I talk, so there wasn't a lot of adjustment happening. Um, pay attention to the way other writers use Twitter, especially the ones who do it well. Twitter, like a sestina or a sonnet, has its own rules and requirements. You have to be fast and punchy, quick and pithy. Funny works, and if you can't be funny, you can retweet people who are. Okay, some writers, okay, Franzen again, <laughs> That picture is so scary. It's like, it's like they said, like, okay, we're gonna go to a place where there are people, and he was like, fuck no. And, but, then, but then they made him, but then he didn't shave. That was his quiet revenge. Okay, some writers say Twitter has nothing to do with real writing, and that it is, in fact, inimical to a true writer's purpose. Here's the quote. I certainly question the model of social media as the way that books are promoted and information about books is disseminated, because the essence of the model is self-promotion, and I don't think nonstop self-promotion is a good head for a working writer to be in. I think it's really badly suited model of literary culture, social media. Writers are alone. They work alone. They communicate through the finished page. It's gruesome to force them to self-promote on a gregarious medium. It goes against everything I know and understand about really good fiction writers. It's a terrible match. 
I couldn't disagree more, except for the part about Twitter being a gregarious medium. And as became clear the last time Franzen went after Twitter, enough really good fiction writers, from Margaret Atwood, to Elizabeth McCracken, to Salman Rushdie, and Amy Tan, and Nathan Englander, and Colson Whitehead, and Mary Carr, and Maylee Malloy, and Curtis Sittenfeld, and Walter Kern, and Steve Martin, are on Twitter to suggest that his views aren't shared even among his literary cohorts. Yes, writers write alone, but all writing is practice. Twitter is a dress rehearsal, a chance to step on the tightrope with at least something of a safety net in place. It's a space to hone your chops, try out new material in real time, a luxury that novelists have never had before. You can watch what's working, what's getting a response, what's getting retweeted. You can play with language in a place that forces you, by virtue of the 140 character limit, to seek out the absolute best word, to say what you want to say as well and as succinctly as you can. How exactly is that bad for writers? Masters of the craft, from Strunk and White to Elmore Leonard, have preached the gospel of brevity and precision, telling us to omit needless words, to cut out the parts no one wants to read. Vigorous writing is concise, Strunk and White instruct. Twitter's where you go to learn that lesson. And yes, for us lowly genre writers who will never see our animated selves on The Simpsons, and <laughs> by the way, for anybody keeping score at home, um, Vogue, good, Simpsons, good, Twitter, Jennifer Weiner, self-promotion. <laughs> um, Twitter is a place to remind the world that you're alive, you're funny, you're interesting, and you write books too. Okay, so now that you are resigned slash committed to being there, now that you're encouraged by the presence of so many great writers on Twitter, and you found your voice and learned what not to tweet about, what are you going to say? You need to find your topic, or to put it another way, find your bachelor. <laughs> um, your topic could be gardening, could be Real Housewives, could, whatever, could be whatever your work in progress is about, addiction or dating or raising kids on a commune. Um, one more note about writers not belonging on Twitter. Twitter is a great place to find sources. Need a cop to explain exactly what happens after someone gets arrested? Need to find out about the sex lives of paraplegics? Or what kosher vegans pack in school lunches? Or how the Audubon Society really feels about climate change? Um, <laughs> There are experts on just about everything on Twitter, and it's more likely than not they're going to be happy to talk to you. So, find something you like talking about and write about it at what feels like the right level of frequency and intimacy. If you just started running and want to share that journey, by all means, feel free. If you made an awesome shepherd's pie, or better yet, if your shepherd's pie was a complete fail, post a picture if that feels okay. Your real life is certainly fair game, but it's not the only game, and it can sometimes be the most dangerous game. So here's a safe place to start. Tweet about what you're reading. Readers love nothing better than to find out who their favorite writer reads, and while promoting yourself is something I'd urge you to do sparingly and carefully, boosting other writers is something you should do constantly, joyfully, and as loudly as you can. It's one of the best things to see on Twitter when a writer you love finds a writer she loves and raves about her book. We can talk about blurbs and whether they work or not, and I'm pretty convinced that they don't, but I can guarantee that a heartfelt endorsement from a writer I love will get me to break out my credit card every single time. Like a certain writer whose name rhymes with Lonathan Jansen. <laughs> That's his noble pose. I will read anything that two of my friends recommend, and that includes Twitter and Facebook friends. I have discovered enough great books and writers on Twitter, bitch planet, y'all, that I can't understand what reader, never mind writer, wouldn't want to be there. Tweet about writers, link to other people's writing. If you read a great piece, if you saw a hilarious YouTube video, if Rob Delaney is on fire, or your local meteor meteorologist was tracking a storm system that looked exactly like a penis. <laughs> okay, I'm glad some of you found that funny too. Um, okay, tweet it, okay? If one of the Times book critics tweets a picture of Henry Miller playing ping pong with a naked nameless model, tweet about that. 
possibly with some pithy commentary about why a New York Times critic is sending nudie pictures before breakfast, and could we please have a shot of Anais Nin playing croquet with a naked dude? Okay, beyond spreading the word about your favorites and retweeting great links, what can you talk about? Ask yourself, what is my passion? What is my love? If you're at a cocktail party and there's a dozen different conversations going on, one about scandal, one about Seinfeld, one about politics, one about professional wrestling, one about One Direction, poor Zane. One about Hillary Clinton's prospects, and one about roses, and one about Trevor Noah's not-so-hot takes on what Jewish girls do in bed. Um, P.S. Everything, because we have to compensate for all the hacky jokes about how we're prudes and don't swallow. Um, which conversation will you join? Roxanne Gay is a serious, critically esteemed writer and thinker who happens to love Ina Garten and The Real Housewives and The Fast and The Furious and she tweets about it. Elizabeth Gilbert posts about spirituality and occasionally, occasionally links to RuPaul videos. It's a perfect fit with her new book without ever stepping across the border into the land of overt self-promotion. Gary Steingart is straight up hilarious, so whatever he's tweeting about is going to be funny. Um, whenever I'm hiring, I always start out by asking, are you too legit, too legit to quit? The range of answers always surprises me. <laughs> I want to go work for Gary Steingart. Um, Elizabeth McCracken tweets about what she's cooking, and Kyra Davis does weekly giveaways of other writers' books, and Terry McMillan shares live your best life now advice with political commentary that says, I'm so glad Ted Cruz is running nothing like live entertainment. <laughs> Everybody's got their something. Whether it's running commentary and wry observations about your day-to-day -day life, or politics, or meditation, or the latest movie, or the hottest TV show, Figure out what you love to talk about and talk about that. Um, what I talk about is The Bachelor, which I've been live tweeting for years. And I tweet in the voice that I use in my books, which is frank and funny and body and feminist and hopefully smart and accessible. And at the end of every show, I say, if you like my tweets, try my books. They're just like tweets, only longer and with sex scenes. And I add a link to my website. And that's it. That's the extent of the hard sell. A single polite reminder that if people like what they're getting, there's a place to get more. I don't know how many new readers I've gotten, how many Twitter followers have made the leap from getting tweets for free to paying for a book, but I can tell you I've heard from enough of them who've made that leap to believe it's worth doing. But the bottom line is I, I do it because I love doing it, and I do it even if there wasn't a payoff. Which brings us back to Jennifer Weinerish self-promotion, which in my definition means promoting yourself as sparingly and infrequently as you can. If you have a new book out today, by all means, say so once. If you can find a funny way to say it, even better. Let your Twitter community take the ball and run with it, or even better, ask them to help spread the word. It sounds counterintuitive, but people really like being asked for help. Um, and if you've been generous about promoting other writers' work, Trust that they will be just as generous about promoting yours. If there are giveaways, link to them. If there's a great review, link once. If you start retweeting every nice tweet and linking to every five-star review you get on Amazon, and P.S., why are you even looking at Amazon? You will shed followers like a white terrier sheds fur on a black sweater dress. Easy test. If you think it's too much, you're probably right. Okay. Um, next, build your brand. Um, which is icky. We, we hear the word brand a lot these days, and publishers talk about not just selling a specific book, but building a career over many books. And we as writers should think about social media operating the same way. It's not a place to sell specific titles, but a place for us to establish our brands, our voices, our personality over the long haul. I know the conventional wisdom is that people don't buy the cow if they get the milk for free, but I believe that a little bit of enticingly free, delicious milk encourages people to pay for more. Don't just tweet when you've got a book out, although you'll definitely want to be tweeting when that happens, especially if you can't count on other coverage. The goal is to be con a consistent and welcome presence on Twitter, someone who's not there to sell, but to connect, to inform, to amuse. Be engaging, be funny, be passionate or revealing or personal to the extent that you're okay with it, 
Oh, and if Shmonathan Schmanzen goes after you in a um, misguided and poorly informed way and says you've never written about something you've totally written about, Twitter is a great place to set the record straight. And finally, only connect. We're almost to the end here. And then I'm going to get on this chair if it kills me. <laughs> All right, only connect. Um, Twitter at its best isn't a monologue, it's a conversation. And I'm constantly amazed at how delighted you can make people by joining in and replying to their tweets or favoriting them or retweeting what they said. You don't have to be on Twitter all day long. In fact, that actually would be bad for your writing. But it takes 20 seconds, I timed it, to send a tweet back to someone, to thank them for reading, to respond to a comment, to retweet something great that one of your followers said. Um, I'll just mention that in the car on the way down here, Judy Bloom tweeted at me, and like my 12-year-old my self died of, of joy. I, it was like, it was a, I'm still like, Judy Bloom tweeted at me, oh my god! Um, so that was cool. And, and like, you know, you don't have to be Judy Bloom to make somebody feel fabulous. Um, a little acknowledgement goes a long way. Um, if the definition of doing it wrong is doing nothing but promoting your own work, then the definition of doing it right must include talking to other people. If you don't remember anything else, if you don't take anything else away from this speech besides the fact that there are a lot of pictures of Jonathan Franzen out there, remember this. Twitter is a conversation, not a soliloquy. Be as generous as you can in everything you do with links to other writers' works, with replies and retweets and favorites, and Twitter will be generous for you. Um, in conclusion, for the vast, vast majority of us, Twitter is not an option, but a necessity. That being said, it doesn't have to be a burden or a chore. It can be a place to talk, a welcome water cooler for writers who work in solitary confinement, a virtual cocktail party for people with too much social anxiety to handle the real thing, a place to find information, test material, hone your skills, ask for help, connect with readers, and discover new writers. It's not a curse, it's a blessing and it's a blessing novelists have never had before. It's not a bad place for us, it's the best place. And with that, Emily, we're gonna do the Q&A. Thank you.